Hi everybody. Today's an important day in your geometry class. We're going to talk about ways to prove the triangles are congruent and how to talk about their corresponding parts. We're going to do some more proofs today. If you do a really good job of making notes through this and showing me that you did, I'll give you a grade for doing that. The next set of proofs I think will have you do them by yourself. Hi Annalisa, you watch this too and tell me if I'm getting this right. Okay, first we're going to talk about three ways to prove that two triangles are congruent. And I'm just going to go through this page that is available to you at Canvas. First, it tells me that AB, this segment, is congruent to DE. We ought to mark these things, and you should too if you have a copy like this. And make that sketch. You can do that as well if you don't have a, a copier. And angle B is to be congruent with angle E. You should mark it that way. And BC, this segment, is congruent to the segment EF. And it says, this information is enough to know that these triangles are congruent by the, by some postulate. We, I want to convince you that these two triangles are, are identical in every way, even though we did not measure the third pair of sides. And this method is called side angle side, con congruent to side angle side. We're going to call this the side angle side postulate. But happily, we're going to abbreviate that a lot with S-A-S. -S. But you'll never hear me say S-A-S -S again. I'll always say side angle side. I want to take a little sidewalk with you on that. I want to use my compass here. And I'm going to create a triangle congruent to this triangle ABC. And I'm going to use that side angle side postulate. This, these, this is just the postulate, this side angle side stuff. And uh, I'll see if I can convince you that it's true. To do this, first I would want to duplicate a side. And you'll see, that's really an easy thing to do. I'm just going to measure how long side AB is, as closely as I could. It's about that long. And I'll come to this working ray, and I'll cut an arc to that size. And allow me just to call this A prime, B prime. And I think anybody looking in my direction would say, yeah, those are the same size, aren't they? AB is the same as A prime, B prime. And if I'm going to duplicate this triangle using side, angle, side, and I just got a pair of congruent sides, now I need to get a pair of congruent angles. And it's an interesting thing how you can do that. First, I'm going to sweep it. I'm going to duplicate angle A at A prime. And first I'll do that by sweeping a ray, an arc across both of the rays of that angle. Without letting my compass slip, I move over to, to point A prime and sweep an arc like that last one as best I could. Then I got to come back here and measure the breadth of that arc, how broad it was, and cut this arc to that size, like this. And for some interesting reasons, I'll be able to show you, show you soon. If I connect a prime through that place, I'm saying that this angle is congruent to that one. This angle is congruent to that angle. Now I have duplicated this side. Let me mark that this side is as big as this one. And now, I should, I've measured a side and an angle. I should measure another side. I'm going to take the length of AC, measuring the length from A to C as carefully as I could with my compass. I'm going to cut this to that size. And I'm going to call that place right there C prime. Then when I cut it, I think these triangles are congruent. Let me mark this fella to be congruent to this fella. I have a side, an angle, and a side, go to a side, an angle, and a side, as best as I could make them. And when I connect these, I think I have identical triangles here. Let's look at another postulate for getting triangles to be congruent. In the next figure, angle P is congruent to angle X. I'll mark it that way. And PR is congruent to XZ. This segment PR is congruent to this one XZ. Further, angle R is congruent to angle Z. We'll agree ahead of time that this angle at R is congruent to this angle at Z. And this postulate that I'm, I'm bringing to your attention tells me that under these circumstances, these triangles are congruent in every way. This is enough information to prove these triangles are congruent by the, and we have to just decide what we're going to call this postulate. And what has been agreed upon thus far has been angle, 
side angle, congruent to angle side angle. That's what we're going to call this postulate, angle side angle. But happily, we're going to abbreviate that ASA. But you'll never hear me say ASA. You'll always hear me say angle side angle when we're proving triangles to be congruent. And forgive me for this, but I'm going to have to show you. I'm going to build a triangle just like this one using angle side angle. I'm going to build it on this working ray. And if I were going to use the angle side angle postulate, first I'd want, I'd want to make an angle probably as big as P. And I remember how I'd do that. I'll sweep an arc across both, across both of the rays of angle P as best I could. Sweep an arc across both of those rays. Move to the place you'd like to, to build an angle like it. And sweep the same kind of arc. Then I should measure how broad this arc is. About that big and cut this arc to that size. Now these two points, this one and this one, determine that line P prime R prime. As carefully as I could. Let me call this place P. And I'm telling you, the way I've built this, this angle at P is as big as this angle at P prime. But I'm going to use the angle side angle postulate. So let me duplicate an, a side at this point. And I'm going to duplicate side PQ. I'll just measure how big it is and then come to this place and cut an arc and call that place Q prime. This place is Q prime. And you'd have to agree with me that PQ is as big as P prime Q prime. I built it that way with my compass. I made those be equivalent lengths. I've duplicated an angle and a side. Now I've got to duplicate another angle. And they have to be in the same corresponding order. Thus, I have to duplicate angle Q at Q prime. It has to be angle side angle matching angle side angle. So let me duplicate an angle just like angle Q at Q prime. First, I'll sweep an arc across both of the rays of angle Q. Go to Q prime and sweep an arc like it. Measure how broad this arc is as carefully as I could. Measure how broad that arc is. And cut this arc to that size. So that this distance is as big as that distance. Now, when I connect Q prime to this place, I'll have an angle as big as Q. Let's take a look. And when I just bring it through, I think I get a triangle just like this one. I've duplicated that triangle PQR. I'm going to call it P prime Q prime R prime. And I use the angle side angle. Let me make sure you that this angle was to be as con congruent to that one. We should mark them those kind of ways. And by virtue of the angle side angle postulate, I've got congruent triangles right there. Let's go a little bit further. In the third figure, mark AB congruent to PQ. All right, I can do that. And BC congruent to RQ. And I don't care who's larger or smaller amongst these. I just know that BC and RQ are the same length. And AC congruent to PR. All right, I'll make this one is as big as this one. This information is enough to prove that the triangles are congruent. Hey, what do you want to call this postulate that guarantees these two triangles to be identical in every way? Yeah, you're right. That's what we ought to call this one, the side, side, side postulate. Side, side, side. And we will abbreviate it, as you might expect, SSS. But you'll never hear me say that again. It'll always be side, side, side. And I think I got a place where I was trying to build a triangle, just like this triangle, using the side, side, side postulate and my compass. I got these for making circles, but now you can do all kind of interesting things with a compass. If I'm going to duplicate this triangle with side, 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 all I can do is duplicate, is use the lengths of the sides. I'll duplicate this side first. Make side just a link, just like it right here. And anybody watching would have to agree with me that x, y is congruent to x prime, y prime. I made those be the same. I won't be able to duplicate an angle here, and it's kind of interesting what I have to do next. I know the side that comes off from Y to, to Z has to be this long. I'm not sure where it goes, 
but I'm going to show an arc from Y. And I know Z is somewhere along that arc. I'm not sure where. I also know the distance Z is from X. I can duplicate that with my compass. I'll do that as carefully as I could. That's how far Z is from X. And I'll go to X prime and sweep an arc like it. Best I could. And I'm thinking, what about this place right here? This is sort of like solving a system of equations. Everything along this first arc is the same distance from y prime as z was from y, and everything along this arc is the same distance from x prime as, as z was from x. So what about that place right there? Yeah, that must be z prime, huh? Let me just connect a couple things together. This one and that one. And I'm here to tell you that I've got congruent triangles. These guys are identical in every way. I never did measure angle Z, but I know that angle Z prime, and Z prime is identical. So there's a few things I want you to know before we start this real exercise. There are three postulates we can use to get triangles to be congruent. We're going to call it SAS, but we're going to call it side angle side. We could write it like this, but we're going to call it angle side angle. We're going to write it like this when we're walking, going quickly. But we'll, that represents side, side, side. Three ways to get triangles to be congruent. And here's the real kicker. Here's the important thing. Here's what today's really about. Once we know that they're congruent, these triangles, we can compare their parts using this axiom, CPCTC, which stands for corresponding parts of congruent triangles are congruent. That's quite a mouthful. Usually when people want to say that quickly, they just say corresponding parts which stands quickly for corresponding parts of congruent triangles are congruent. But when you write about it, you're just going to write CPCTC. Now, I've got a few proofs set up already. These are the proofs that show up on that printed page. And what we're going to do is walk through there and show you how we can make this happen. I'm going to use these postulates. I'm going to use this every time. This CPCTC stuff is corresponding parts. It's a big deal in your geometry class for a while. Every proof you ever do, you'll have to make a sketch, and you'll have to write the given, and you ought to do it like I'm showing it right here, and then this is what we would like to conclude. We are given that E is the midpoint of AB and DC, and we are to prove somehow, if this is true, that this length AD and this length BC must also be the same. And this, this is going to be quick and easy. Come along. I'm going to make some marks on this paper. Since E is the midpoint of AB, if E is the midpoint of AB, you're going to have to agree with me that this is as big as that, that AE and EB are congruent. And if E is the midpoint of DC, likewise, E is the midpoint of DC, then this segment is congruent to that segment. And since these vertical angles are congruent, I think we're going to have a side angle side relationship matching up with side angle side, and we're going to get congruent triangles. And then we can talk about the corresponding parts and we'll have this thing all figured out. I have my given in place. You might want to pause that video, get your given in place, make the sketch. I'm right on the side of what we're trying to get to prove, but now I'm ready to go. We have to make statements about this. What makes you think these segments are congruent anyway? Call this statement two. Well, if E is the midpoint of AB, then I can safely conclude that AE is congruent with E, B. And if E is the midpoint of D, C, it is clear to me that D, E is congruent with E, C. I need a good reason for that over here. What do you think that ought to be? Just because it's a midpoint, you think these segments are congruent? Yes, yes I do, because that's what midpoints do. But rather than write over here, because that's what midpoints do, we're going to call that definition midpoint. By knowing what a midpoint does, definition of midpoint, we can declare that this would be truthful. And I'm happy to abbreviate some things. Now that we've got that marked, what were we saying about these angles right there? Yeah, they ought to be congruent. I can't say angle E is congruent to angle E. Let me name them with, with, with three letters. Angle AED is congruent with this vertical angle partner, angle CED. 
What makes you so sure they're congruent? Because vertical angles are always congruent. Vertical angles are congruent. That's what I meant to scribble right there. Therefore, these angles would be congruent. Let's mark them that way. And then I ask you, have we met one of these postulates? Because that's really what we want to do. Have we just met one of those postulates? And yes, we have. We have a side, an angle, and a side. Can go to a side, an angle, and a side. So it is triangle time. I'll name the first triangle any way I want. I'll just say triangle DEA. But then, as we name that second triangle, we ought to do that with care. And I'm sure the angle at D matches the angle at C. I should begin with that. And if I went DE, that would match CE. So it must be CEB. What makes you so all fire sure that these triangles are congruent, mister? Well, I have met the side angle side postulate. And that's good. And part of what we were to do was prove that these triangles are congruent, and we've established that. But now, now that we know that triangle DEA is congruent to triangle CEB, is it safe to conclude that AD, first and third position, AD, is going to match up with BC? Oughtn't they be congruent? And the answer is yes, they will. So quickly and easily on the fifth step, we're going to conclude this proof with the thought that AD is, in fact, congruent with BC, which is what we wanted to prove. And why do you, what makes you so sure? Just because these triangles are congruent, that these parts would match up. And you'll say, that's because corresponding parts of congruent triangles are congruent. And that's how the game's going to be played for a little while. Now, that's a, that's a friendly proof, but for now, we're going to do some friendly proofs. Take a look here with me, please. We are told, with this, given this picture, and you have a sketch like it on the, on the printed page, if you have that with you, it says that AB bisects both angle CAD, it's going to bisect this angle, and CBD, that one as well. And we're supposed to prove that these couple of triangles are congruent, and some kind of way that angle C is congruent to angle D. There's something to show you as we do this one. The first step will be given, I'll call that statement one on the second proof, in statement two, I'm going to use those thoughts. And we might benefit from calling this angle one and angle two instead of calling it C, A, B. And if we could just call it angle one and angle two, it would be a little easier. I'll call this angle three and angle four. And if A, B bisects angle C, A, D, I hope you would agree with me that makes angle one be congruent with angle two. But likewise, if it bisects angle C, B, D as well, yeah, for the same reason, angle 3 would be congruent with angle 4. But we do need a good reason. We've got to write something over here that says why these angles must be congruent. And the thought should be that's what angle bisectors do is give you a couple congruent parts of an angle. So rather than write, because that's what I think angle bisectors do, we're going to go definition angle bisector. Mark it that way. The angle at 1 is congruent with the angle at 2. The angle at 3 is congruent with the angle at 4. Now here comes an interesting thing that we have not discussed before, but we should. Any one thing is congruent to itself. And isn't it true that AB is congruent to AB? And that may sound kind of silly. And usually when people use this property, they put a bunch of marks on it like I just did, illustrating that AB is congruent to itself. And that may seem dumb to you for right now, but I, I'm saying it's going to be part of what we have to deal with. Make that note with me that AB is congruent with AB. Over here on the right hand side, I'm going to call that the reflexive property. Anything congruent to itself, at angle C congruent to angle C, that's the reflexive property. AB congruent to itself is also the reflexive property. We're studying this figure, and we've got AB congruent to itself. I think I've met one of those postulates. You see if you think I have. Looking at this figure, have we met a postulate? In the upper triangle, i got an angle, a side, and an angle congruent to the lower triangle. An angle, a side, and an angle. I'd say yes, we have. How we name them is, is important. I'm going to call the first one triangle DAB. That one isn't important. I can name that any way I want the first one. But when you name the second one, it has to be in the proper corresponding order. When I started with D, you ought to start with C. If I went DA, you would go with CA. 
So when I said D-A-B, you had to say C-A-B. And why are you so sure that these triangles are congruent anyway? You say, well, I use the postulate. What postulate did you use? The angle-side-angle -angle postulate. We accept without proof that these triangles are congruent if those angles and that side are congruent in this order. So what? You got congruent triangles, mister. You think that's going to make angle C congruent to angle D? You think that the angle at D is congruent to the angle at C? And I say, well, yes, I do. I'll write it just as it sits right here. Angle C is congruent with angle D. Why do you think so? Because if the triangles are congruent, then their parts must be. The corresponding parts must be. And we can say that quickly and easily with corresponding parts of congruent triangles are congruent. And that's all we needed to have for that little proof. They might get a little more interesting. We've only seen a couple. At any time, homies, if you think, hey, I don't know, this, this is too easy, pause it. Do it yourself. That would be great. I'll take care of this proof right now, though. I have to take this walk with you. It tells me ahead of time in the given. This is statement one of my third proof. The first statement for us will always be given. And we are given that AB, I ought to make that mark, is parallel to DC. Let's make it look like they're parallel. I'm going to put those arrowheads on there. I think after you've done this a few times, you're going to, that'll clue you to think about things. And also AB is congruent to DC. Mark them that way. And if this pair of sides are congruent and parallel, apparently these other sides have to be congruent. That's what this is telling us to prove. This is what we're given, and we want to prove that these sides, AD and BC, are congruent. And I know the ticket will always be the same idea with what we're doing today. We're going to get these couple of triangles to be congruent some kind of way. And these will be corresponding parts. We do have parallel lines, and parallel lines does tell me about angles. I'm going to put a 1 here and a 2 right there. And I wonder what you think about those angles on statement 2. I'm going to go right to using that parallel thought. Yeah, if these lines are parallel, that makes angle 1 be congruent with angle 2. What makes you so all fired sure? And you do a good reason right here why. And that would be because if lines are parallel, then we have congruent. What kind of angles are those? Alternate interior angles. And that may look kind of scribbly, but that's that's kind of typical for me. And I tell you, that's that's a pretty good, pretty good way to describe that. When these are parallel, we can expect these angles to be congruent. We're also given this information, which I've not logged onto. Oh, I have logged onto. It. Those segments are congruent with one another. So I've got a side and an angle congruent to a side and an angle. I need to get another angle or another side and get going to get these triangles to be congruent. And maybe you're thinking about what I'm thinking about. What if I put this series of marks across here? What do you think? that might imply. Not that it's great big with lots of marks, but instead that DB, this segment is congruent to itself. Hey, what's the name of that property when something's congruent to itself? Yeah, that's the reflexive property. The reflexive property of congruence. We'll just leave it at reflexive. Now, I have to ask myself, have I met a postulate? I don't think I have. Uh, what postulate have you met, sir? And we'll have to sort through those. It's going to be side, angle, side, or angle, side, side angle, or side, side, side. And you'll tell me by looking at the picture. And that's why you got to make these marks. I have this side, and this angle, and this side congruent to this side, this angle, and that side. Yeah, I got congruent triangles. I got triangle. I'll call the first one ABD. congruent with another triangle. And if I called mine ABD, you'd have to call yours CDB. And what method did you use to get them to, go, to be congruent? Yeah, this is the side angle side, wouldn't it? Statement four. That makes sense to me. Let's, do, let's go further. Statement five. Now that I have these congruent triangles, is it safe to assume that AD from this triangle, first and third position, would be the same as BC or CB? Yeah, those are the same segments. I, yeah, I think that is a safe assumption. I will go with AD is in fact congruent with CB. 
And you say, well, what makes you so sure just because these triangles are congruent that these parts would be? And you say corresponding parts. Corresponding parts of congruent triangles are congruent. Let's go further. This time, and this is the same sketch for the for the fourth proof on the on the printed page. It tells me that E is the midpoint of both AC, AC and BD. Okay, and uh, we're going to prove that these lines are parallel. Just because this is the midpoint of those two segments, these lines are parallel. Let's see if we can establish that. This is the fourth proof, but this is my first step. It's given. Now, if E is the midpoint of AC, we can safely conclude that AE is congruent with EC. Yep. We should mark it that way. Not only that, but E is the midpoint of BD, so this is going to be congruent to that. E is the midpoint of BD. We should make a statement about that here. E is congruent to ED. And that's definition midpoint. That's what makes me so certain that those must be congruent. I know what midpoints do, and that's a midpoint. By the definition of a midpoint. You need something else to get these triangles to be congruent. And I hope you're thinking, well, those vertical angles will do it right there. Angle. AEB must be congruent with this partner, angle CED. It could, I could have called it DEC, it would have been fine. I'm just naming a pair of angles, and those are, those are the, the angles that their vertex in the right place were, were cool. Those are, the, why do I think those angles are congruent? It's because vertical angles are congruent. Always will be. Now, have you met a postulate? And yes, I have. Then let's talk about congruent triangles. You, you'll tell me about the postulate too. Triangle ABE, triangle ABE, is congruent with its partner. And I'd be a little careful here. A is at the end of that segment with two slashes. That's going to match with C, won't it? And when I went ABE, that'll go CDE. And I got those triangles to be congruent by side angle side. But now, now that I got the triangles big good, that was okay, that wasn't so hard. How am I supposed to get these lines to be parallel? What kind of thing could guarantee that lines are parallel? How about if this angle at B was congruent to that angle at D? Because I'm pretty sure the angle at B is congruent to the angle at D. If the angle at B were congruent to the angle at D, would that convince you that these lines should be parallel? Because those are alternate interior angles. I'm convinced it would be true. So this is what that would look like as we approach that, that, that access to this proof. I'll say angle B is congruent to angle D. That's clear if I name them B and D. What makes you so sure they're congruent? Well, they're corresponding parts of congruent triangles congruent. It's important that you put this alongside the step each time. And you can number them and put it somewhere else, but I want them side by side. That's how I know those angles are congruent by corresponding parts. And then, if angle B is congruent to angle D, I think that's going to convince me that off of this transversal, the size of angle B tells me how this line's going to run. And that same, si that, that same size angle here is going to tell me how this line's going to run. Yeah, that's going to convince me that those lines are parallel. I'll follow with that right here. AB is parallel with DC. Just because these angles are congruent, you think those lines are parallel? And yes, I do. If you have congruent alternate interior angles, then you have parallel lines. And that's what we wanted to prove here. I got another one I get to show you. This one isn't any harder than anything else. It's a nice proof. But look what we're going to show. We're given, and, and let's just mark that given ahead of time. AE is congruent to DE. And AB is congruent to CD. And we want to prove that this triangle, EBC, this one right here, 
is isosceles. Uh, first, I would, I would want to ask, well, what would convince you that this triangle is isosceles? And what would convince me is it must have a couple of congruent sides, and if those sides were congruent, then it would have to be isosceles. If we could get these triangles, these smaller outside triangles, to be congruent, I think these would be corresponding parts, and then we could conclude that that's an isosceles triangle. We've got these sides matching with those sides, don't we? And I have to get pull a, pull a quick one here on you. We haven't talked much about the isosceles triangle theorem, but I want to use it here. The isosceles triangle theorem, I'm going to prove it for you real soon, but I think we've discussed it before. It tells me that if you have two sides in a triangle congruent, if these two sides are congruent, then the angles opposite them would be congruent. This one would have to be congruent with that one. In fact, if those angles are congruent, these sides would be as well. That's a biconditional. But all I care about right now is, hey, wait, look at this big triangle right here. That triangle ACADE is an isosceles triangle. These two sides are congruent. Which angles would have to be congruent in that big isosceles triangle? And right off the bat, I'd say angle A would be congruent with angle D. And I'm going to call that the isosceles triangle theorem. I understand you're going to need a little time for that one, theorem. But when two sides of a triangle are congruent, the sides opposite them are congruent. So I'm now convinced that the angle at A is congruent to the angle at D. Is that going to make these triangles be congruent? And I'm thinking it would. Let's make a note about that. I'll call my first triangle A begin. Triangle ABE is congruent to its partner. Let's name the other guy carefully. The angle at A matches the angle at D. AB matches DC. So that must have been DCE. How did you get those triangles to be congruent anyway, mister? Better be one of those accepted postulates. And in fact, it is. It's a side, angle, side, matching side, angle, side. That one happens the most thus far. But, and I think it often is one of the most common ways to, use, to get triangles to be congruent. But now... What we want to prove after we got these triangles to be congruent is that this triangle EBC is isosceles. And I ask you again, what would convince you that this triangle is isosceles? What would convince me is that we'd have to have a couple of congruent sides. They'd have to have some legs. And I think that this side, EB, from this triangle, ought to be congruent with EC in the other. Yeah, these, let me put four on each. These should be corresponding parts of these white triangles, forcing that blue triangle to be isosceles. Let me get this on paper correctly. I should go with EB is congruent with CE. Yeah, those are course corresponding parts of congruent triangles are congruent. And if that is true, and I completely believe it, that these are corresponding parts of these congruent triangles, thus triangle EBC must be isosceles. How did you get it to be isosceles? Just because two sides are congruent, you think it's isosceles? And I say, yes, I do. It does what isosceles triangles got to do by the definition of an isosceles triangle. And that would complete that. Let's do one more together. It's a pretty good one. Let me express the given to you. Triangle ABC is isosceles with base AB. You'd want to make a sketch like that. M is the midpoint of AB. We are to prove that CM is perpendicular to AB. Now this is a, this is a pretty serious little proof for, for beginners. And about, let, me, let me take this walk with you and show you about it. You would always want to mark that given. So what triangle ABC is isosceles with base AB? Uh, if it's isosceles, it's going to have to have a couple of congruent sides. We're going to make a statement about that, but let's just mark it and start visualizing ahead of time. M. M is the midpoint of AB, isn't it? If that's true, if M is the midpoint of AB, isn't it, this segment going to be as big as that one? I think we're going to get these triangles to be congruent some kind of way. Might need a little reflexive property, but we can get these triangles to be congruent. Let's do that. Let's get those congruent first, and then we'll find a way to make this happen. Statement two. Now, we've got the, a couple things going on in this given. Let's start, take it a step at a time. 
What if triangle ABC is isosceles with base AB? Oh, this thing's isosceles. That's how I knew that AC would be congruent with BC. Just because it's isosceles, you think these two sides would be congruent? And I say, yes, I do. That's the definition of isosceles. A triangle is isosceles if and only if it has a pair of congruent sides. The definition of isosceles triangle. But then you also said that M is the midpoint of AB. And if M is the midpoint of AB, that convinces me that AM is congruent with MB. What makes you so sure? Well, it does what a midpoint does. We'll call that definition midpoint. Later we'll have more theorems and less, less definitions. But we're starting this stuff and we're doing a pretty good job. Keep up with me. Now, we want to get these triangles to be congruent. I think it's a good little hint of what you got to think about to make that happen. Anytime a pair of triangles share a common side, that reflexive property ought to be at your beck and call. Let's say that CM is congruent with CM. Yep, that's the reflexive property. It's quite helpful. Along with ver vertical angles, keep those thoughts in mind, reflexive property. So we got congruent triangles, don't we? Statement five. Let's make a statement about those triangles. I'll call mine AMC. Triangle AMC is congruent with, and how would you name yours? It'd have to be BMC. How'd you get them to be congruent anyway, mister? Well, did you meet one of those postulates? Yes, I did. All three sides of this one mentioned all three sides of that one. That's a side, side, side postulate. So great, you got congruent triangles. How in blaze are we gonna get these things to be perpendicular? And you might remember the last set of proofs we did. We talked about a couple of angles being congruent and supplementary. I'm going to think about these two angles, angle one and angle two. I think they're congruent. I think they're corresponding parts of these congruent triangles. I think they're congruent and I'm pretty sure they're supplementary because they're a linear pair. Let's establish that. And you think back to what we might have proven last time we proved a stack of proofs. First off, angle one, congruent with angle two. What makes you so sure? I'm sure, that's statement six, this is statement five, wasn't it? I'm sure of that because they're corresponding parts of these congruent triangles. They've got to be congruent. Are they supplementary? Yes, I, I'm sure that they are. Angle one and angle two are supplementary. What makes you so sure they're supplementary? For statement seven, because a linear pair is always supplementary. So now, let's look at this. If these two angles are congruent and they're supplementary, what do you know for sure? And we just did prove that on the last stack of proofs. If a pair of angles are congruent and supplementary, then they're in fact right angles. So I'm going to say angle, the measure of angle, I'm going to say angle one is a right angle. And I've got to write a sentence out here of why that's true. Two angles, congruent and supplementary, implies they are right angles. So I know angle one's a right angle. Would that make CM be perpendicular? If, that, if they make a right angle? I say, yeah, that's just what it means. I conclude, conclude with you that CM is in fact perpendicular to AB. Just because they make a right angle, just because they make a right angle, you think they're perpendicular. So yes, I do. For statement nine, that's the definition of perpendicular. Lines are perpendicular. Definition perpendicular. If and only if they form a right angle. These form a right angle, so they're perpendicular. So, big long stack of six proofs. You show me a nice clean copy better than mine. Give me a picture of that, and I'll give you a great daily 